Hi, my name is Mackenzie Mathis. I'm an assistant professor and co-developer of Deep Lab Cut. Today, I'd like to tell you about our efforts to build foundational models for animal pose estimation. As you might know, Deep Lab Cut has been used in a wide range of contexts, from centipedes to mouse parenting, to trail tracking, to cell cancer biology, to social behaviors and marmosets, and even 3D cheetahs on the safari, Deep Lab Cut has been used in a plethora of example and downstream applications to track the pose of these animals. We originally developed Deep Lab Cut to be able to build tailored customized neural network architectures for use in the laboratory using very little input user data. And one of the ways that sort of our scientific contribution, if you will, was to show that Deep Lab Cut required very little input human labeled data for downstream supervised analysis of deep neural networks. So what we showed is that as long as your data is so-called IID or in-domain, these networks can generalize to unseen animals and give you a confidence of their performance. This was largely due to our use of ImageNet pre-trained networks. As you may remember, ImageNet is a large scale data set from apples, objects, matches to tennis. These items are not labeled for key points, but imbue the network with very good natural image scene statistics. In follow-up work, we also showed very formally that independent of the architecture, these ImageNet models or these ImageNet pre-trained models could perform very well on not only within domain data, but also generalize much better. So what you're seeing here on the bottom right is an example from across a series of architectures that they themselves have different performance on the ImageNet benchmark, i.e. efficient nets being the best, versus training from scratch up here by using these weights, we showed that on our downstream pose estimation task, i.e. in this task called Horse 10, these really outperformed from tracked screening. So now we find ourselves a few years later, and we know that many users, very humbly, are using these tools to build their own customized tailored networks. But at the end of the day, this means thousands of models are being trained on oftentimes closed source animal data sets. But what if we could combine all of this collective knowledge, all of this collective data into better foundational models that we could use that might be even better than ImageNet? So in the last few years, Alexander and myself, led by Shafai, a talented PhD student in my group, have been trying to tackle this problem. But there's a few challenges that come up in this large quest. One is that even though people are using Deep Lab Cut as the tool base to create tens of thousands of models, it doesn't mean they're all creating models even on the same key points with the same names. So let's just take a relatively simple case where you have three different laboratories that are tracking mice from this top view perspective, but in lab one, they might label the key points as such, in lab two, likewise. And if you combine them, you'd have a mismatch in this key point space. And so you wouldn't want to train a model with, in one example, this is an example ground truth key point of the nose, where there's no example the ground truth key point and the other, they would cancel each other out. Even more of a problem is that oftentimes the names that we give our key points are not identical. Sometimes the nose is a snout, or it's mouse nose, or it's uppercase n or lowercase n. So we need to understand the semantic and key point mapping between these data sets. So to start to, to approach this challenge, what we need to be able to do is to map to a common reference frame and then come up with ways to train these neural networks to not penalize for missing data or for new key points only in one data set. So what I'm showing you here are 12 different data sets that have different key points, but we could map onto a sort of standard super animal reference frame. So this is effectively what we did for two broad classes of models to show you how this might work. We call these super animal pose estimation data sets, which then lead to downstream super animal models. One is a top view. This is a very important viewpoint for many things in preclinical medicine, and of course, behavioral neuroscience, and then also a side view of animals. In particular, animals that are quadrupeds share the fact that they're quadrupeds, so we could train these data sets across all of these different animals, from cheetahs, dogs, horses, cats, sheep, you name it. If it has for legs, we try to include it in these data sets. And then what we did is we showed on completely held out data sets that have never been trained by a model that we could do zero shot, meaning this data has never been seen in a training phase. We're only testing on this data and show that we get exceptionally good performance. And I'll show you how we could achieve this. So for example, we held out the original DLC open field benchmark set and their now newly introduced uh, multi-animal data set. 
and show this performance uh, versus in this quadruped model, we could show that even though there's no giraffes in this data set that we trained on, it could do quite good inference on this quadruped model, both in rodents, of course, and or anything like giraffes uh, or even elephants. But coming back to the problem setting, how are we going to continue to tackle this and what needs to be done? So first of all, more data is always going to be better. So we need more open source data sets. Labeled data is even better, but we can also leverage unlabeled data, just purely using animal videos. So you can imagine if we could collect everyone's deep lab cut projects or effectively build web apps or um, curate public data sets, what we needed to be able to do is build these generalizable data converters to not only map the key points, but to just get them in the frame data space. Ultimately, what we want to be able to do is train these super animal models and then take any of the inputs like videos or images or your deep lab cut project and be able to give you either zero shot, again, never used to be trained on, on videos, on images. And if it's not good enough, having tools to be able to fine tune on images or videos. And then of course, the final output of this is to make sure these models are shareable. So to do this, we started the Open Zoo um, Model Zoo Initiative, excuse me, which you can find more information here. But a big component of this was actually building out the tooling and models to start even collecting this data. So you can check out Contrib at Deep Lab Cut, where you can annotate, um, contribute to open source science. You can contribute models or data, or you can also test our models that are already in the zoo on your data as well. There's also a Hugging Face app for this, which also does bounding box detection based on the mega detector. So here's kind of what this data actually looks like. If we want to do zero shot image prediction on, the, on some held out data sets, as I mentioned already, giraffes and rodents, but anything, even things like antelope or elephants that were not seen in the original data, this model now can do zero shot inference on. This also works on video. So of course we want this to be smooth across time. So of course each frame in a video is an image, but it's important to make sure that we have statistically uh, even, if you will, uh, key points across this data set. And then of course there will be data that is not within the bounds of the limited data sets that we already have so far. And so we wanted to make sure we built new tools to be able to fine tune on these actual data sets and improve performance. So what I'll show you on the next slide is some of the solutions that we came up with. Of course, this is not exhaustive given the short nature of this talk, but one of the ways that we needed to tackle was when you add new data sets to these models, we need to overcome catastrophic forgetting. We don't want the model to forget what it already knew. So for this, what we do is we run the supermodel on a new data set, do zero shot inference on this target video or um, images. We save those frames and use that as pseudo labels to act as a memory replay buffer. So now we have a data set that has key point knowledge. It might have all the key points here. And now we have an, uh, kind of a super animal model that learns the new knowledge without forgetting previous ones. And this is what it actually looks like. So you can imagine on the top, if we would fine tune on a model that only say had four key points, but our bulk model now has more than 25 key points, you would get performance that looks something like this. It'd be okay on those four key points, but it wouldn't be good on the rest of them because it would have forgotten what we had trained it in the super animal model. But now with the memory replay, this is a model that has never seen this data set. This is zero shot video inference on this data. And you can see that more than 25 key points are um, tracked. So in short, if you wanted to fine tune on new data sets, you could ultimately just use a few key points, throw this back into the model and fine tune with this strategy. So very briefly, this is a lot of data, but just to orient you to this, what we showed is now these super animal models with memory replay are outperforming ImageNet pre-trained on four major data sets. So both the in-domain and the out-of-domain horse 10 benchmark we show zero stop performance. And then even with a few frames, say 14 frames of data, we're getting impressive gains over ImageNet, which is these orange colors. And these new additions I'm showing you are in purple. This is also true in our newly introduced iRodents data set. So you can see zero shot is already very good, but even with three images or up to 17, you can start to boost performance on this. And again, with this open field uh, deep lab cut data set, you can see we already are outperforming ImageNet pre-training and fine tuning only on a handful of images even boost performance further. So this is about a 10x data efficiency. And we also show that if you have a video that isn't playing very well, is there a bit jittery, we all can do zero shot video adaptation. So this makes it extremely smooth 
um, and it runs and fine tunes on the video at hand that you already have. Another big problem, just very briefly, that we generally see in animal pose data sets is people can use images and sizes of all different things. So although the models might be trained on a particular feature size, these models haven't seen it. And so we adapted what we call a spatial pyramid, which is a standard thing in machine learning, and show that we can already get very good performance now on these downstream tasks compared to without using the spatial pyramid. If you want to check this out further, everything is available at deeplabcut.org. So you can check out our website beyond our tools to learn how to use the code and find this dedicated page on the model zoo where you can check out the models um, that are already available. Some of them publicly contributed, which is fantastic. And these new super animals will be coming out very soon. You can also very quickly launch this in Google Collaboratory and try this out on your own video uh, very, very quickly. So with that, I'd like to just highlight a few contributions we've made at this work. We show that you can do a zero shot inference that's better than ImageNet without any labeling required. If it's not good enough, you can fine tune on only a handful of images, and you can even do this on video, so do our uh, zero shot video inference um, with this test time augmentation. With that, I'd like to thank my co-developer, Alexander Mathis, and of course my funders in my lab for all of their hard work, and thank you for your time and attention.